Hello and welcome to The Postcard Professor, where we take complex ideas and explain them in the space of a postcard. In this video, we're going to be looking at the displacements from our shape functions and using those in order to calculate the stresses for both truss and beam elements. Now let's start with the stress in a truss element. In order to investigate this, we need to go back to mechanics of materials where we know that the stress is equal to the Young's modulus multiplied by the strain. Now, fortunately, this epsilon here, the strain of our truss element is easy to calculate. That's just going to be the change in our U displacement in the X direction. Now, this is dependent on the shape functions that we want to use. So if we look at our nice two node element, we know that the displacement is equal to u1 times 1 minus x over l plus u2 times x over l. And so taking the x derivative of this, we end up with a positive u2 over l and a negative u1 over l. So we can write that as u2 minus u1 over l. Now, notice that there are no contributions from the position in this equation. So what this means is we have constant strain in our element. So once we have our displacements, we can just calculate for du dx, which is exactly epsilon, and then that strain goes into the Young's modulus equation up here, and we can solve for stress. Now things get a little more complicated whenever we move to our three node element. And if you recall from our shape functions video, we found that the displacement on the element was equal to u1 times 2x squared over l squared minus 3x over l plus 1. And then we had similar equations for u2 and u3. So again, in order to calculate our strain, we just take a derivative with respect to x. And so we can write that we have x over l squared multiplied by, this will be four times u1, and then we have a minus eight times u2, and then plus four times u3 we'll have another set of terms which just have one over L out front. And that will be a minus three U1 plus four U2 minus U3. One thing to notice is that we do have a contribution from our position. So this is no longer constant strain, it's a linear function. And so we can say that this is a linear strain element. Now, typically, we're interested in the maximum stress. In order to find the maximum stress, we just need to find the maximum strain value. So in order to do that, with a linear strain, we just need to look at the two endpoints. We can't have a maximum or a minimum in the middle of our element when we have a linear strain. What we need to do is calculate du dx when x is equal to zero, which is just going to be this term over here. And then we also need to do the same thing when x is equal to L. So when we do that, this leading fraction becomes one over L. So we can just add these together. So this becomes a u1 minus four u2 plus three u3 all over L. And you can see from this that there's some level of symmetry, which is nice. That's what we'd hope to see. We can say that our epsilon max is simply the maximum of these two values. I guess it's the maximum absolute value, either the maximum or the minimum value, depending on what sign we're looking at. And then our maximum stress is equal to the Young's modulus multiplied by that epsilon max term. And if we're just interested in the absolute value, we can take the absolute value of everything and then just find the 
maximum stress, whether that is compressive or tensile. Now, everything here is for a one-dimensional bar. And so we need to remember if we are looking at a two-dimensional truss, we need to convert to the local coordinate system of our bar element in order to calculate these things. These U's are intended to be in the local reference frame. Or another way of saying that is that these are actually the delta Cs that we calculated back when we were looking at the 2D truss element theory. Okay, so this is what we need to know for the truss elements. Let's go take a look at our beam elements. So the stress in a beam element looks a little bit different because the only way that we get a tensile or compressive stress is through the bending. And so what this looks like is, again, just our Young's modulus multiplied by our strain, but that strain is now the vertical distance from the centroid of our cross section to the location inside the beam, multiplied by the change in the rotational displacement with respect to x. So again, we're going to look at our two node, uh, and this is as far as we're going to go for the beam. Going back to the beam shape functions that we discussed in a previous video, the rotational displacement is equal to V1, which is our vertical displacement, multiplied by 6 x squared over L cubed minus 6 x over L squared plus V2 times something very similar. And then we have a phi1 term, and finally our phi2 term. But of course, what we care about is this d phi dx. And so we're going to take an x derivative of that rotational displacement. And we'll just leave it in a very similar form this time. We have v1 times 12x over l squared minus 6 over l squared. The v2 term looks very similar. And then our phi 1 term becomes 6x over l squared minus 4 over l. And the phi 2 term is 6x over l squared minus 2 over l. So once again, we have linear strain because the highest order that we see in our d phi dx term is this single x. So we follow the same process where we find the maximum value of d phi dx in order to figure out our maximum strain. And in addition to the maximum d phi dx, we also look at the maximum distance from the centroid of our beam cross section. But this is just a property of our beam, so we don't need to do any math for that right now. So the final process here is just to evaluate d phi dx at x equals 0, which is just going to be 6 over L squared. So taking out this piece and this piece, and that'll end up being v2 minus v1. And then we have our 2 over L and 4 over L. So we'll take out the 2 over L and end up with 2 phi1 plus phi2. And then at x equals L... Uh, sign just changes uh, for v1 and v2. And so this just becomes a 6 over L squared, v1 minus v2. And then here we end up with a positive 2 over L for the v1 term and a positive 4 over L for the v2 term. So this becomes a plus 2 over L. And here we get v1 plus 2 v2. Now, just to recap, for our two node bar element. We need to look at the local reference frame, but we can find the displacements in that local reference frame, and our strain is based purely on those. Very simple equation. For the three node case, we do need to go look at both locations, x equals 0 and x equals L, and find out which of these is larger. For the beam element, once again, we need to look at the local reference frame. So we need to convert 
are V1 and V2 to delta eta's. Fortunately, rotation does not cause our phi's to change, and so we can just leave those as is. So the process here is we find our u's or our v's in the local reference frame. We calculate the maximum value if necessary, or if we just have this two node element, we can just use that constant value. And then we use that in order to calculate either sigma t or sigma b. And if you remember our frame elements, which are our two dimensional beam and truss together elements, those would have both a sigma t component and a sigma b component. So we would need to account for both of those whenever we're finding uh, the maximum stress. And just be careful of your signs whenever you're doing that. In any case, that about covers it for finding these stresses. I hope it was helpful, and I will catch you next time.